So, um, folks, now we have an amazing person that um, I just have had the tremendous honor of calling him my friend and calling him our friend. Um, when we first started on this journey together, I evoked his name, and um, and at the time, I will read to you what I what I said, and I asked for his permission to, if I could say this, and he said yes. Um, Olin Bishop last year participated in the sense um, in person gathering, and at the time, he invited us to not think of this as another conference but to accept this as an invitation to utilize our collective consciousness to not only tap into the knowing of our times, but to the collective knowing of all times. And then to utilize that storehouse of knowledge and wisdom to create the world we want to live in. And I just feel like that we're bringing that strand, that string all along. So for now, I want to read um, to you a little bit of um, Orland's work in his own words. This is what he says. The work to which I have dedicated my life is to attend to the ancestral shrines Ancestral shrines are co-creative imaginative influence on how I see the world. They serve to enhance the human encounters that form relationships and community within which I work and live. The primary emphasis of my work is to support the recovery of the individual's capacity to stand in openness to the higher purpose of one's own life. My work is in the service of the creative freedom of others. Orlin Bishop is the founder and director of Shade Tree Multicultural Foundation in Seattle, in Los Angeles. Oh, I say Seattle, hmm, in Los Angeles, <laughs> where he has pioneered approaches to urban truces and mentorship that combines new ideas with traditional ways of knowing. His recent book, The Seventh Shrine, is a meditation on the African spiritual journey from the middle passages to the mountaintop. And currently, after 20 years of meditating around, around this, he is now ready to work on, um, with a group of people that he's been gathering, to work on creating a sanctuary in Los Angeles which will be in the service of humanity. So I have said enough. I would like to now turn it over to Orlin Bishop. Sao Bona. Sao Bona. My dearest Victoria, Zaya, Mauricio, beloved community, thank you so very much for the invitation again to share in this spiritual quest together in liberating our will towards this higher calling that our time has given us. Something has stirred in me after being in this morning's um, sharing with our beloved Madana Shiva, who sees so far into the, the primal nature of of this earth and what it is to be uh, dedicated to the preservation of what gives life itself to us. So I am in deep, deep gratitude that I've, I'm inspired and feel, still feeling the awakeness of my own cellular memory from this contribution that we just shared together. Um, Victoria, I'm thinking of your gifts to my life over the last years, but particularly in the last few weeks as we um, shared in the preparation for this, this time. And uh, thank you for um, hosting with Lisa and the team <laughs> um, this 
this way of working now with consciousness. And this is now our seventh day in the exercise of looking at the various themes through which this forum has been shaped to allow our thinking to go into different um, rhythms of reflection. And for me, this, this particular day, I, I, I chose it out of the idea of the number seven. There wasn't so much any other factor. Um, but why seven, for me, represents the, the stage in which the, um, the human part, which, which then has to become connected with the intelligence in the realm of the superconscious can now begin to be called on. And so there's, there's the will process goes through different stages of development, the will, the human will. And we can see those stages in, in from birth of the human being into the world, coming into the different stages of development. But at the seven stage in consciousness, we realize that we're not individually separated from anything. And that will could be developed earlier in life or it could be developed later in life, but there is this seventh level of will as a kind of uh, analogy to uh, initiation. That when our will reaches this level, our initiation, one can say, is global, it's universal, it's psychical, and potentially holds the capacity to begin where nature is always in beginning and enter into that process of a kind of genesis with nature to truly co-create and sustain the world at its primal levels. This level of activism is critical for our age because of the levels of toxicity that we have already accumulated in ourselves and in the environments where we live, how much more willing we must be to be able to enter into the kind of work to not just take violence out to the world, but to take these astral toxicities out of the world, that in a certain way, are keeping our own vibratory consciousness from reaching a level of development where pandemics would not be a threat. These externalities that are still the result of tex to to um, toxic factors that we have released into our environment from our own kind of breakdown of life energy. And so the human being, we just don't create things alone. The human being creates beings as well. Not just other human beings. But we put into the astral world, the energetic world, temperaments of soul and mind. And these forces take on a life of their own over time because of the collective use of each other's toxicity or unconsciousness, if we want to phrase it that way. And we have a, an environment that is constituted by waste matter of consciousness. our own nightmares, really, that nature itself can't deplete from the world. We have to do that work from a level of this will that I'm going to speak about today. This will in which the, the human experience holds uh, an idea a little bit beyond hope.
and and it was such a beautiful statement that that was shared this morning that hope is cultivated. And then Shiva has made the statement that hope is cultivated from will, from the willingness to suspend our belief in only the circumstances and uh, dedicate our inner aspiration of will towards being able to create something more that actually purifies our environment. Hope is a catalyst for a state of consciousness that then becomes connected with nature's creative, etheric, life-giving substance. And hope helps to recover deep memory in the out of the unconscious so that when we are interacting, we have this feeling of trust towards a collective aspiration. But I want to also speak about faith as part of my own practice, different than hope. Faith moves into a domain in which nothing exists. Even the circumstances for which we are trying to transform ourselves in. Faith is a kind of preparation to step out of the body's memory as it's given into a domain of creativity that gives the human being a kind of creative act of will that is not limited by the circumstances themselves that we face in the current reality. A truly non-local expression of consciousness. At the superconscious level, and was at the collective consciousness level in which my faith is not in myself um, alone, but in every being whose will effort will support what I am holding as a doorway through which their act of creativity can occur. Faith is me allowing the universe to pass through my circumstances into the world. An act of will in which I dislocate my framing of identity to be able to be a host for the sacred act. In a critical time like we are experiencing now, it is important that we understand some aspects of the human consciousness that can truly demonstrate in a very practical way, in a phenomenological way, in a imperative empirical way, how this will works. If I give an imagination to us in this moment to say, imagine a door, any door, a door from memory or a door created out of your imagination. And as you recall this door, as you put it into consciousness, where is it being created from? One can say memory, but what really is that? Light. All of what we're doing is the use of light. Everything that we recover in consciousness, in reflection, is made of light. This activity that we're doing now in imagining is light. Now this is how flexible light is to our consciousness. It can allow the use of this force to become something more creative and more 
imaginative, more inspirational, aspirational, and more intuitive eventually at a level in which a kind of improvisation can happen. And we find ourselves in unity with the sacred nature of everything and can embody that as a host. I was thinking back when this when this pandemic crossed into um let's say well when the virus idea and I'm saying idea because most of it are still our ideas and the misuse of our ideas that we can't truly understand that we're creating more illness by the way we think about things and how much life lives could have been saved by a different kind of thinking about this particular crisis and whether or not the the the, the pathogen uses our consciousness to go where we predict it should go Energy follows thought. All energies follows thought. Life, light, love. Our thoughts are like those seeds that Dr. Van Damme Shiva spoke about. We put reality into flow by thinking or not thinking correctly. So how much of this, this pandemic is actually the creation of our thinking towards an entity that we call a virus or, and then it becomes now a cultural crisis, an economic crisis. by our reactions to it. So I'm examining the will and what is the will that we carry in our own human nature capable of transforming and whether or not we are really willing to be with with this question. I came across a poem some years ago and I love reading it. And I would like to share it for a moment with us. It's by the poem, poet William Stafford, passed some years ago from your neck of the wood, Victoria. He was from Washington State. And he wrote this poem called, You Reading This Be Ready. Starting here, what do you want to remember? How sunlight creeps along a shining floor? What scent of old wood hovers? What softened sound from outside fills the air? Will you ever bring a better gift for the world than the breathing respect that you carry wherever you go right now? Are you waiting for time to show you some better thought? When you turn around, starting here, lift this new glance that you found. Carry into evening all that you want from this day. This interval you spent reading or hearing this, keep it for life. What can anyone give you greater than now? Starting here, right in this room, when you turn around. There's only some instructions in this poem. <laughs> At least to me, I found much instruction in it. Starting here, where, where, where is the here? And we all can find here wherever we look and locate not all, only our bodies, but our, our soul. This, this inner principle of the uncorrupted part of the self 
that wants to do the right thing with its powers. That's willing to do the right thing with its powers if these other conceptions of identity can be let go of. What can anyone else give you greater than that? We have what we need to be in our time. Starting from here, not from out there. There is no out there that will make a difference. No one else will give us anything else that will make a difference with the world that needs to come into being. We're still working to overcome inheritances that have been misinterpreted by culture. Miseducated by culture, misdirected by pursuits of will that have not allowed this being to come into the world, fully awakened for its responsibility to the sacred nature within the larger environments of belonging. History is not just what happened. History also includes what could have happened that didn't because we weren't willing. And that history must be recovered. We must recover the history that was almost happening on because we didn't agree it didn't because some use of violence stopped it from becoming history must be understood more broadly than what happened because the human nature is that we know better than all of the things that happened that kept our lives from becoming we still carry a dream that wants to still become, in spite of all the things that have happened to us, there is still something that wants to live its full story. And the William Stafford asks, you know, what do we really want to remember? What is the nature of this remembering that this time out that we've been given time to utilize and ask ourselves, if I come out of this, what do I really want to bring to the world? What to whom do I really would like to really connect with in the highest shared purpose of agreements that we can co-create? And so in, in, in contemplating all of what the contributors have shared in these days towards this community, in the theme of wisdom in this time of crisis, To arrive at wisdom, we have had to have gone through certain stages of, say, awareness in becoming. The first stage is perception. Perception allows us to take in the world, and the world then gives us a feedback. Our consciousness gives a feedback to, say, some information. And then we investigate it. And there are all these inner processes that were shared that gives our perception a way to become cognition. So now something has got my attention, and this is a critical stage in consciousness, attentiveness to something that has stirred from my environment into me. And what do we do with attentiveness when it's given to something that I don't yet understand? And over time, this becomes uh, knowledge. We begin to know the thing that's happening and my own reactions to it. And then I cultivate a different level of knowledge 
which is my continuous development to be able to understand the thing in its nature. And if I can get to that unbiased understanding of the thing, it becomes a dialogue with it. This is the stage of wisdom. I'm not changing just the thing. I'm changing the relationship to it as well. And at this level, reality has a very different outlook. We can actually create agreements from the level of wisdom as to what happens with things that we don't need in our lives like viruses, we have a choice, a conscious choice to say, I don't really need you to belong in my nature. Maybe there is a space for you somewhere else and I could help create that. There's no violence in that act of wisdom. You know, only agreement, creative agreement with entities that have their own purpose in the world. But at this level of purpose, everything fulfills their space and the interaction is lawful according to the state of consciousness that we hold. And so I feel like we're invoking that in this practice today and these last days. What is the reference point for this will of wisdom to take the violence out of our reflections about this current reality? And what is it, what would it mean to create a kind of immunity for our time through this discipline of maturing our understanding to a shared understanding because this is more this is now required to be done by the collective process of willingness so this is where faith comes in how trusting are we to let the person the other person this is a reference Utilize my will to belong to something far more creative. Like, are we willing to share our will without any emphasis as to what it could be, other than the agreement, no violence with it? I'm willing to give you my will if you say I would not use it for violence. I could do that psychically. We all could do that psychically. If we can get to the level of cognition we call wisdom, it's a psychic state in which all of our will unites to do something that does not require any thought process that prefers one thing over another. But it's the union with sacred law through which a kind of next level of truthfulness. Truthfulness is now the act of removing the veil from the unconscious forces and the superconscious forces that we can see the whole nature of our age what's hidden in the time construct of our collective unconsciousness, our collective consciousness. Wisdom is the doorway to that act of will. Well, some people call it thy will. But this thy will is ours when we agree to share it. 
And we do so from time to time. Those who are in meditation are giving their will to the world in its becoming. When we are in deep contemplation of our own suffering, we are giving our will. When we are in grief, we are giving our will. The, the, the soul knows how to allow our will to go through this metamorphosis to be able to reach this level of creativity. And in so doing, we can then unite with uh, a shared principle of a collective act of bringing something into the world. That carries a similar analogy of the work that the dead is doing from the disembodied level of reality. And so after death, there's a kind of realization that I'm more willing to be myself from the level of soul because nothing else is in the way. And in that stage of consciousness, we do more for this world than we have done before death. And when we reach this level of wisdom about life, we know the dead is in dialogue with us about futures of the world, potentialities of our world, but also it's the most endearing devotional religion in the world. So the dead is the most significant religion in the world. Why? Because their level of devotion and reverence for this earth and for who we are still becoming is probably the most sacred thing we could receive into ourselves. The states of that will, if we could realize it, we, we don't feel the gravity of this attachment to the body-mind. And in their space, in that space, the dead becomes more alive in our own consciousness. And through that unity, we replenish the earth with hope and faith. I was born into a story, a history of a crisis that lasted for some people 400 years. It's a, it's a crisis that lasted that long of not having access to the will to even live out the fundamental dreams of life. And it was spoken to different people can have, you know, shared the different stories of this history of our world. And those who keep the wisdom of those stories get to the point in which they have to ask who is willing to be initiated out of these stories? Who is willing to go the next step of where the story can become something else. And often it's a very difficult decision point to take up that level of initiation because it's probably the, the level of crisis in which you have to choose something that many are not willing to sacrifice for that greater good. It's a very difficult, difficult choice. And I think back um, through my own study, I, I, I use Martin Luther King Jr. as one who looked 
a crisis right into its face and said, I'm willing to stand in the midst of this crisis and decide for a different reality. The next day, he died after declaring the reality visible to consciousness. Some futures are that significant to life. Some stages of development must be earned by the willingness to stand against all the forces of our current reality and not be attached to what could be lost if the threat is so significant as it was for him. Yes, there were those who wanted him dead to keep that reality from becoming. But how much of that is still in us? How much forces are trying to keep us away from these futures? And so the wisdom of this time asks us to stand together because it's only this sharing of the will at this level of the seventh will level of wisdom. So right before the truthfulness of why, why I truly did it, because it's a choice, could be revealed to us. There's no privilege to protect one from what will happen when I stand in that truth. It's not based on power, position, privilege, personality, none of that. It's really about the soul knowing that if I choose to die before I die, if I choose to liberate my grief from my body to this collective space where I know that if I don't open this door to these futures, more death will happen. Most of the things we're dying are of this world, made from the discarded energies of the mistakes we've made and the betrayals that we've made and the unwillingness to uphold the dignity of our own aspiration. And so it was also shared this morning Dr. Shiva, that we, we have the potential for a kind of forgiveness. Understanding is like that. When I come to an understanding, I forgive my ignorance. I let it go. I let it go. I now belong to the space where my understanding could support my other levels of aspiration. And I think we understand that we are in a crisis. We've been in it for a long time. This is not just another thing. This is the same thing coming back over and over and over again. And it's been with us for hundreds of years. It's a bad nightmare that would not go away because our will has to be lifted out of this pattern of unconscious agreements. And we are invited, really invited, to belong to an act of will that is more liberating, And William Stafford, just starting here, maybe we could choose that. Just starting here. It doesn't require going all the way back in history. We have that already as a given. What is not given is our agreement to start here, to make a difference. And it is my prayer, really, 
that I'm witnessing the starting of a new culture. Utilizing all the goodwill that has been given by cultures who have held this prayer for a long time. So it's not new, but is renewed by our participation in it. And if we can renew this world by participating in the prayer that's always been for healing, for health, for justice, for peace, we would not need politics as the way or economics as the way when our prayers can reach each other's will that is the most sacred act. Because from there, everything can be made new again. And we can take out of this world the toxicities that have limited our mutual recognition of each other's future. And with that, I would really like to invite some reflections with you in how we could share that more deeply. Thank you, Orlin. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, your words reverberate through my body and my spirit is lifted. Um, I would like to, yes, ask people to raise their hands uh, if you have a question. And then uh, Zaya and Mauricio will bring you in here to, um, to ask those questions to meet them. And Zaya, if you have anything you'd like to ask. I, I have no words. There's no words here. I just, I'm taking it in. And you speak to the soul, Orlando. There are no questions there. Just, Heather. You're yeah. muted now. Yeah. Well, um, thank you, Orlin. This was powerful. <laughs> and I almost have no question, but there's something right at the end that you said about um, the participation, like renewed participation and how we are creating a new culture. And it strikes me that um, that is a culture in itself that, that has... Uh, traveled through time with humanity that there are those always in a culture of newness and there are always there are some who are always in a culture of not newness and that newness actually persists and it just kind of like moves as a, as a spectrum um, through time and I wonder if you could speak to maybe you already did I mean you're you're speaking to the imagined futures that didn't happen and we are that imagined future that's not happening, that's now happening. Um, can you go, can you just go deeper into this, this understanding? <laughs> Am I, I making I, yes. you understand my question? I do, Heather, thank you. I follow the thoughts. Thank you. So the, 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 the soul knows its, its primal purpose is to carry life potentials for every age. These bodies are only a certain way, the doorways through which the soul acts to bring that to the world. And every generation of human beings carries with it the unfulfilled dreams of previous times. The soul carries that. So an age, an age which constitutes 2,600 years, 
is a totality of a certain kind of looping of souls re-establishing a context through which it will bring fulfillment mm -hmm. to the entity into which it was born, which is the earth. The earth from a level of development is not what we have in this civilization. This civilization has not reached its highest potential because as much as we believe in certain values, we've not lived them. As much as we've written about good things, we've not done that because we're afraid to be initiated. What Dr. Vandana Shiva spoke about, the, these undeveloped men in the world holding power in a culture where the power should be service towards the good. But when you're uninitiated, you're not willing to take on the responsibility for something sacred. Mm -hmm. So you go and dedicate all the life to the profane mm -hmm. acquisition of more power. And so part of the culture is, can we reestablish the context of development, which had to do with initiation in every civilization of the past, from the ancient rishis, Egypt, Greece, all through Africa and in the indigenous world, initiation has been there as a primary prerequisite to suspend the cultural space where I am only pursuing my interest, to allowing the interest, which is these futures, to pursue us and transform me. I, but I have to suspend the normal boundaries of the culture to do that. So this culture has nothing to achieve, this new culture, this renewal. Well, nature will create it for us if we don't do it ourselves. If culture doesn't do it, nature will initiate us. And, and because it's, 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 a, it's a sacred law to have medicine in the world. It's a sacred law to have peace in the world. It's not our, it's not our thing to do anything with. There are things that fire, earth, water, and air holds as an alchemy to give our consciousness a doorway for something else to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Heather. Angelita. Angelita, you are muted now. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. There you go. Yes. Thank you. This is an amazing journey with you. This morning, dearly right now, I moved to reflect on the idea without activism. You're leaning in. Angelina, your signal is very weak. We cannot hear you well. If you could maybe, maybe you type, type in the, the chat. question or... We cannot hear you properly, Angelita. How about now? Better. How about now? Way better, yes. Yes. Is yes. better? Yeah, louder. I mean, it's, it's weaker, but it's clearer. Speak louder from what you're doing now. Technology. Yes. Hold on. Beautiful. Oops. I think we lost you. Are you there? Hello? Yes. yes. Perhaps you should come back to me. Okay. Yes. Let's do that in a moment. Let us know when you're ready. Um, Jamie, maybe you can unmute yourself. Do you want to find Jamie? 
Jamie? No. Okay. Okay. Victoria? Victoria, can you unmute yourself? Am I muted? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, some of us in the chat, uh, inspired already earlier this morning, have been um, talking. Some of us are come from an artistic um, background and an artistic vocation, which I would say not to create duality, but it's it's more I think um, an intuitive expression of consciousness than a what I would call an information uh, expressed consciousness. And I'm just wondering if you could speak to how you see um, artists of, of any dis, of any <laughs> genre contributing powerfully to this to this development of consciousness and this awakening. Yeah, thank you so much, Victoria. Um, in, in in reviewing histories where art was in observation. So the, the first artists actually went out into nature and experience through phenomenal observation, the forces of creation in light, in substances, in movement. This is the inner imagination that was awakened that gave the artists the domain of this expression. It was an initiation to become an artist. Mm -hmm. People had to practice, open up their perception to these higher levels where it moved from imagination to inspiration and then to intuition, as you said, the creative act that allows the, the improvisational use of this inflow of the muses or the archetypal world. And so people reflected back as a kind of sacred act. The artist created what the gods revealed and gave it back to them in a form. It was put into temples, it was put into shrines, it was put into culture. But people knew that these artists were not just doing something as a means of commerce. It was a it was a instruction. And so it used to be called the lesser mysteries in ancient times, which also wasn't just art as aesthetics, but it had to do with music. It had to do with, with sacred geometry. It had to do with language, grammar, rhetoric, speech, how to communicate the way that we are inspired to do. So we've lost the context of many of these mm -hmm. ancient ways of becoming human. Mm -hmm. And now we have a kind of freedom that this is my gift. Well, it was given before we received it as ours. It was it's part, still is a given domain of the superconscious. And there are many things to still create from this other level of environment. But I think, yes, the artists must play a role in rededicating this level of consciousness to the act of living artfully in, in every way so that we could just not just produce something, but I said, we produce beings by how we perceive the full act of creation. Um, we, we, we affect, if, if, if a person plants a garden, they are also putting elemental beings into the soil, not just seed. We're putting energy into things. And so, yes, I know uh, many good artists who are in a certain way rededicating their own practice to recovering the sacred context as well for that. And it's an important part of our recovery of this culture. Thank you. Well, how, how um, I just wanted to ask you, how do you see um, 
artists being able to engage in, in creative, constructive dialogue with, um, for example, the people in Silicon Valley that were, were mentioned that earlier this morning. How, how can we integrate and have a, have a fruitful dialogue? Yeah. So uh, I often said that, that the, the hospitality must be on the side who is most willing hosts the conversation. <laughs> so if you're willing to do it, invite someone from Silicon Valley to, to, to lunch and ask the question, <laughs> what, if you're, what if you can be in service of something that they may want to really bring into the world? Mm -hmm. In a way, the sacred hospitality must be part of our offer. That's beautiful. Thank you. You're welcome, Victoria. Thank you for asking. Beautiful. Thank you, Victoria. And there is a follow-up question here. Aonor, shall I read it or you could speak it? Uh, your audio is good. Can you hear us? Aonor, are you there? Okay, I will just read the question. So Aonor is giving a quote from WH. Alden, the age of anxiety. We would rather be ruined than changed. We would rather die in our dread than climb the cross of the moment and let our illusions die. Um, so the question is, what role do we play in the shift of the, our dominant logic? What do we do with 1% without offering them uh, or othering them, assuming their aspects of ourselves. Thank you, Alnor. The, the, any examination of any structure of reality, you will find the thoughts that created that reality. So if you look at anything, if you look at anything in the world through observation, you would, can come to understanding the thoughts that created it. And so the question is not, to let those people be misunderstood. We can understand them and understand the context that shaped their way of logic. And the question would be, what is the next stage of what they're thinking? Can we support them to think the way that their inner predisposition no one is born into that thinking. We are cultivated into it. Just like you say hope is cultivated and faith and trust are cultivated, thinking is cultivated. And so no one, is, no one should be in a certain way, as you said, othered to because of their thinking. The critical thing is if we could understand them, they could understand us over time. Why? Because the, the the potential for a shared understanding is always there in if we're willing to hold the context that we trust them to think differently. But we have to trust them to think differently, whomever it is, whoever the other is. I mean, I've been in conflict resolution work, you know, gang intervention work with, with, with people who are really willing to kill each other. The question is, what could do you really want to live for? And could you invite that person into that as well? So I think, I think the creation is, is still ahead of us of, of the question that we want to ask the person who might be standing in a different point of view of the world. Thank you, Erlen. I think Alnor has, yeah, he cannot unmute himself. Okay, okay, sorry about that. Thank you for the question, Alnor, yeah. Um, David, David Elzi, you unmuted? Yes. I am. Hi, Orland. it's great to see you again after yeah. last time in person. Yes, David, thank you. My question is, in your infinite, uh, or your elaborate and artistic way of speaking such expansive wisdom of the human condition. My question is around the body as a vehicle, as you speak about us as artists of the ever-present gift of life that wants to be expressed. Can you just elaborate in your own words on how you perceive this physical form 
and I know it's not a fixed reality, but we'll call it the body for the moment, how you perceive this as part of the artistry that we are to live uh, these days, being artists of life, bringing in the sacred. Whatever comes to you, I'd just be interested in how you perceive the body's involvement in this artistic expression of the sacredness of life. Yeah, thank you. I, I studied um, the, the body science for many years. And um, my understanding um, shared with others is that the physical body carries five generations of memory. So we have 62 people's story imprinted in the life substance that the body carries as its um, living predisposition. And so we're working out certain kinds of inheritance from our parents, their parents, going back mm -hmm. five generations. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, uh, the, the body takes in the immediate environment based on certain kind of um, uh, magnetism in the psychic state of the soul life in that body. So the place where we are, the body is also constituted with that. Mm. It influences rhythms of development for us. Um, all the other relationships that we make, both the ones that work in our favor and those, those adversarial ones as well, shape our bodies factor. And then food, nutrition. But the body is a memory space. Mm. It's not only the ancestral memory that it, that, it, that it carries, it carries archetypal memory. So the substantive world, the mineral world, is being remembered by other beings whose intelligence it is just to give the physical domain a dimensionality or say a context for it to be realized. So the physical body is not just human. <laughs> there are other beings who influences the physical body to be in its design appropriate for human consciousness to interact with it. And those beings whose work it is, is to give the human form a kind of initiation for the soul to journey through. So it's really a certain way, um, a gift mm. Mm -hmm. to have this construct we call the human form and the intelligence behind its nature to understand that it's, it's um, when our soul leaves it, it dissolves back into the constructs from which it was created. Right. But if we follow that process of the dissolving back into reality, we will know how much power it is to live in it and animate it and to develop it, to be able to reach these higher octaves of expression towards the superconscious use of it. So all the sense perceptions that we have now are only latent potentials for higher functions if we're willing to bring the body's vibrational energy up to a level in which it could experience a more luminous use of electricity, magnetism, and light, love, faith, hope, these virtues that actually release much more energy into the psyche than the conventional thinking around identity being only a physical, biological reality. So when you say beings, Orlin, are you referring to all of nature, all of creation, rock, trees, nature, breath, air, sun? And, extra, and extraterrestrial, meaning intelligences beyond. Uh, so our solar system, so the planet Mars has an interest in who we are. Mm. We don't know yet what that is because we, we think it's there. And we mm. point it as there. We don't know what Venus does for the human life. We don't question our, our solar system as something that has an intelligence to who we are becoming and what our bodies, we know, we know a little bit about the sun and the moon. That's about it. But mm -hmm. there are far more intelligences that are interested in the human being's condition 
Wow, you're, you're blowing my mind, which is what I always wish to have happen in the sense of you're implying that the infinite intelligence in the infinite forms that it can take throughout the cosmos, we are interconnected with. So it is, is diminishing our arrogance of being, um, uh, you know, centric, uh, human centric in intelligence. So I appreciate what you're saying very, very much. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. Thank you, David. We have probably time for one more question. Uh, Vijay, you unmuted thanks, now. Thanks, thanks for uh, taking my second question. Uh, actually, it's a follow-up of, uh, it's an integration of the two lectures. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, please. okay. So, uh, you know, I heard about your interfaith uh, efforts and uh, I think the big boys are also in one of the states in Silicon Valley. And, uh, you know, uh, having a dialogue with them uh, and engaging them into some kind of a collaborative work to shape the future, post COVID kind of future. Uh, you know, maybe we can kind of utilize some of your, um, your, your known methods to do that. I mean, um, I actually, a couple of years ago, I was trying with Mauricio to establish some kind of a dialogue from within Intel Corporation with, uh, with SAND, and it did not go anywhere because you just don't get it. And, but today, the uh, world has changed. And I see some receptivity to some of these new changes, much more because it's a once in a century, once in a millennia kind of event that has happened. And, uh, you know, only yesterday I was looking at this Fortune magazine where some of these big boys who are like in the heart of developing this artificial intelligence and designing the architecture of this and all, they kind of, I, I saw them reading this Michael uh, Singer's book and, uh, you know, uh, think, thinking about soul and this and all that stuff. So they are kind of, um, they should be open to dialogue. And also, uh, as uh, Vandana talked about this morning, uh, Neem Karuri Mal's uh, following in Silicon Valley is quite strong. People know about Steve Jobs and stuff, how he was kind of influenced by him. And, and so there is some kind of a opportunity. So can we use some of your methods that you have established through your interfaith methodology to kind of be activists and move in that direction to engage them? Uh, I'll be happy to know what, what that might look like. <laughs> I, I can't think of it clearly what the application. I, I, I understand, um, VJ, the, the aspiration um, to host the space with people who are interested in technology. Um, the, 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 the fact is, is that in all these ecosystems that comprise our, our global culture, there's a need to support people to feel um, engaged with their humanity. And in the same way that I would do it for, for people in Silicon Valley, I'll do it for the refugees because there's so much hope already developed with the refugee communities of this world that actually could probably bring this earth into a, a different orientation of consciousness faster than the, the going into a place where there is doubt about our future. So critical for me, it would be who is most likely to engage with the level of consciousness that we're talking about, who at this very moment are most willing, based on the initiation that they've already gone through and prepared for. So in a certain way, our worldview has to be, again, about where spirit is pointing. Spirit is not pointing to Silicon Valley as the primary space for which reality could become. It is to the edge. I remember one of the stories that Michael made share in, in his talk is about how this healing come into the world, is we go to the edges. There are people who are already sitting on the edges of this world who are seeing the futures very clearly and they need support. They need support to be able to bring that back to the center of the culture and be celebrated for taking the risks that they have been born into, for many of them, they've been born into those risks. So this is not about a privileged space. 
But I realized that, yes, we have to be inviting to everyone. But I trust that those who have already gone through a certain kind of suffering are much more likely to understand the opportunity that our world is calling into. Yeah, I, you know, Arun, I, I think where I was going was that in, in this, because of this COVID thing, the world has changed so, so quickly. And in April, our CEO gave a call and 2030 goals he established. And I'm going to call, read it. It says, RISE strategy for 2030. RISE strategy is responsible, inclusive, sustainable future enabled through our technology. So they are looking for sustainability. They are looking for inclusion. That means we are all one. That can, those concepts. And, you know, it's their words. So we can just show them yes. a, a, a new picture right. of their, their uh, issues agree. that they are trying to see. Yeah, I agree. I agree. This is, this is where I think people are finding the intention to host. And the diversity must be, must be part of it. The diversity of voices, of visions of dreams and aspirations, because the, 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 the aim is not for expertise to change anything, it's for humanity to be welcomed into belonging. And so the diversity could be someone who, who may, may not have this opportunity to be on a call like this, mm -hmm. but they're already awake to certain futures. Yeah. And we have to welcome yeah. everyone who has been holding whatever edge it is for our world. And these people are very powerful people and, yes. uh, you know, a lot of influence. So. Yes. Yes, and we should use it correctly. I Thank agree. You. Thank you very much for the question. Thank you. There's one last question. Shall we take it? <laughs> Orlan, is that okay with you? Yes. Jane, I see you, your hand is raised. You're unmuted now. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you for taking another question from me. Um, yes. I am. My question is about intergenerational connection. And um, in the culture where I exist, there is a loss of the tribal connection of um, being able to hear the wisdom of the, the youth and um, and I, the generation that is labeled as baby boomer, I see so much of a disconnect um, in the ability to communicate. For example, myself, I'm 42. I'm in the middle of, of several generations. And I'm just curious about how, um, on a spiritual level, in the realms of ancestry, how we might bridge those connections to bring forth a shared collective wisdom that will guide us forward. Yeah, thank you for the question. It's been my interest for many years to walk, work and support intergenerational um, experiences. And particularly where, where, you know, you said you are in this into, in, in a space, two things happens at that point for, for life. Is that someone in a younger generation looking at you and asking, how did you get through your story? How do you make your story more creative for yourself? So they want to know that. The older generation is also asking, there are parts of my story that I didn't live. Who do I tell it to? You know, so in a certain way, the, the, all intermediate generations are bridging the aspiration of those who are coming into life and those who are in a certain way knowing that they're moving towards the end of life, mm. what is it that must be shared? And the, 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 so there's a kind of framing when I meet someone, which side of my, the scale of my own soul are they going to affect? Mm those going towards the other world or those coming from the other world. Okay. Every human being stands between worlds. Mm -hmm. We're a bridge between life and death, becoming and fulfilling. 
in a certain way, we, we always can allow a person to complete the next stage of their life by understanding that it's not about the information alone, it's about the energy of reciprocity for what they're longing to encounter with you. Mm-hmm. The, so the cultural thing gets supported to have another dimension of attention, which, which in a certain way allows you to be trusted with whatever they're going to ask you to host. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Yes, you're very welcome. Thank you, Jamie, for that last question. Mm-hmm. And thank you, everyone, yes. for all of your questions um, to Orlin. Mm-hmm.